So this came about something like about four years ago when I was here and Joseph Benici and I were sitting in a, a poster presentation and it was potentially an extremely interesting project, a PhD project that was being reported on. But unfortunately, the person giving the presentation had a 10 minute slot and spent seven minutes just going through some of the statistical tests and why that particular statistical test was a kind of important. And you can see all of the audience sort of drifting off and losing consciousness. They didn't want to know about it. They, were, they weren't economists and so on. And so we came up with the idea that to run a, a full workshop to try and help people to understand what's actually important, both in the multidisciplinary and actually in any other type of conference. It really doesn't matter. And one of the things that's really shook and shaken quite badly, over, significantly, shall I say, over the last couple of years, was I suddenly got involved in a lot of business conferences. And it has surprised me just how many business people are really good at giving presentations compared to academics. But when you think about it, we academics are actually in the business of communication. That's all we're there for. When we are in front of our students, we are actually giving essentially a theatrical performance to engage our students in the interesting things we have to share with them. And yet, how many of our colleagues do we sometimes see with 20 lines of text on a slide and they stand reading it in a monotone? And the audience can read it. So why am I reading it? So what I've done, and I do a variation on this for our first year undergraduates every year, about what are the important things about giving presentations. So there are just four things that you need to think about. What is it I want to say, which is everything, then you narrow it down to what I absolutely need to say in the amount of time that I, well, I'd like all that much time, but I've got that much time. And, and there's two other questions which I won't mention just here. So, as a context, how many lectures, how many presentations, and so on, do we see the boredom? And yet, what we're looking for is that sort of engagement. I can see you looking around. Now, there's lots of you smiling. You've been there, done that, you've got the t-shirts. Now, let's do something to introduce. Yes, this is multidisciplinary. We are not looking for the technicalities. We want to know what it's about, why is it important, why is it interesting, and have we got something to say that shows its impact. We're all very, very different. And in multi well, it doesn't really matter whether it's multidisciplinary or not. When we look around ourselves at our various conferences, we go to the academic conferences, the any business conferences perhaps, we're all different, we've all got different backgrounds. We want a story. We want to understand something interesting. And what was interesting to me about, I think it was a year and a half or two and a half years ago when I first got involved in a lot of these business conferences, was the fact that I'd done, picked up some work in 2014, in October, November, from the SAS Institute <coughs> in partnership with an uh, industry or organization in the UK, and they were looking at the skills that they were looking for, <coughs> basically for graduates, or un well, people who just graduated from university. And part of it was, these are the technical skills that we would like to see, and part of it was, here are the important soft skills that we really need, but we don't seem to be getting from universities. Things like Curiosity, you know, that's a thing that two-year-olds have it 
and really get under, the, under your skin. And yet, all of our education systems around the world do a staggeringly good job of getting rid of curiosity by the time they come to us at the university. And then we have a three-year game to try and put some curiosity back into them. Because if they haven't got curiosity by the time they go to work, and you get employed, they're pretty much useless. Creativity. We need to get our students to create. We need to get them to identify problems and then solve problems. We need them to do critical thinking, which many of you are now doing. We saw that in one presentation just now. Then communication was about the fifth one. But the one that was interesting was storytelling. Industry was saying we need people coming to us who can tell stories. And so what we have done on the program that I'm particularly involved with is we don't even teach the technical stuff. They can find it. If they want to learn how to use SAS or SPS or R or Python, go find. Go practice. We spend our time on the, the BSEIT uh, that I work with a lot, assistant uh, program leader. We spend almost all of our time nurturing the soft skills. They go learn the technical stuff. We don't bother to teach it because they can find it. We set them, they learn it by being given challenges that they have to negotiate a problem that's really within the specification but they're interested and they go with it. So we're lots and lots and lots of different sorts of things and we're looking for, as an audience, a story. You know, why are you here listening to me? You see, it comes back to this whole. You are wanting a story as an audience. So I, up here, or you, when you're up here, should be thinking of telling a story. With a beginning, a middle, and an end. You see, storytelling is what, as it says here, is the way to collect, to get meaning and our emotions together. And if we don't connect with our audience, both at the emotional and the intellectual level, we won't remember. Now, you will already notice that there's hardly any words on here either. And one of the things I discovered a couple of three years ago at the SAS Global Forum uh, conference in, I think it was uh, Washington, they had a keynote speech for the academics at the conference showing us how to get rid of the PowerPoint problem of bullets and bullets and bullets and bullets. You see, if you put too much text up there, the audience is going to spend all its time trying to read it while you're trying to talk. And nothing gets in at all. And I first of all thought, hey, it's going to be awfully difficult to find all the pictures you need. And sometimes it's a little bit tricky. Maybe you need it rough. You know, for some of the research projects you're showing, you're, you're presenting on, the PhD students, or we as sort of research academics, a graph or a picture is much more important. Because you, as the audience, who see it very quickly, and then I can talk about it, and you can listen, and all of what I have to say actually goes in. But that way, the story is much better communicated. Yeah, we're incredibly Say the children are up to three or four, and some of us are as well. I've got a colleague, and you know, we notice everything around. So we have a 10, 15 minute discussion every day. Sometimes we're looking at the pack of the weeds growing in the flower bed, just because it's there. There's interesting things. Just that little group of weeds there are growing more strongly than the weeds over here. Why? Or we look at a bench that's round. Um, <coughs> sort of a circular flower bed. And it's got three rows of wooden slats about that wide and about that thick, and about that much gap between them. And we have noticed, because we're inquisitive and we're observant, that underneath one of the gaps, all the way around, 
is a little uh, ridge of sand where the water drops through presumably and kind of moves the sand around as between the little bricks on the floor. Now, I say that to illustrate intense curiosity. That's what we should be instilling into our students. That's what we should individually have to come up with interesting ways of presenting what we have to say. So try to get our audience to be really inquisitive about what we're saying, about our story. Now, I love this saying from Albert Einstein. Now, remember, he's a guy who first invented, came up with a theory of special relativity, a groundbreaking discovery in the early uh, 20th century. But it's that thing. That's what drove him. Our audience may well be like that. And I, in this sort of audience, I sincerely hope we are. As presenters at conferences, academic and other, we, as a presenter, which also making connections between ideas and with people. Because if you're an early researcher, you're a PhD student, you want to get feedback. You want to get the other people to help you, to work with you, to get ideas. The same goes for us academics, long in the tooth as I may be. Connections with people as a presenter and to the audience to connect new ideas. I mean, just sitting here for the last three hours or so, been interesting with everybody who's presented has been giving me ideas that I can connect in my head to develop my model of how the world works. So with connections, making connections, people and ideas are also an extremely important part of giving presentations. So, as we look at giving an academic presentation, This is where I have to go back into words because I can't come up with pictures that capture each of these. It's too difficult. So you can't do everything by pictures. <coughs> so we want to know what is the really big problem? Where does your research problem fit into it? Now, this is a big macroeconomic problem. And here's my little bit sitting at the edge here. But, but it's important because explain and justify. You see, what you're doing when you're up here presenting about your research, or anything else for that matter, is answering, initially answering a question to the audience who are gonna say, why should I sit here listening? You know, it's like how when we're talking, helping our students develop their writing skills, which are, you need to have an abstract which summarizes your piece of writing. And to begin with, you finally do the process abstract. This report does this, and this, and this, and this. And then you think, well, if everybody's answering this one big question, they're personalizing it in individual bits, every single one of them can write the same process abstract. I've done it effectively, I've done a literature research, I've captured some data, done some analysis, and presented conclusions. Gee whiz. That doesn't tell me why I should invest any time reading it. Give me the content abstract. Sell the idea to me so I can go and invest time and learn something perhaps. Tell me what's interesting at the end as to what I'm gonna come up with. So, why is it interesting? Why is it important? Tell me a little bit about your approach, yeah? But don't go into depths about all the types of methodologies and all these funny statistics that go, come out that everybody talks about. But one of the things I found when I was um, on one of the editorial boards for a journal is how many people in the field of education are doing research and qualitative probably with 10, no, so 50 to 100 respondents. And they then go into high order statistics of T's and 
other stuff. And you think, hang on, there's 100 students, and you're trying to find four-factor analysis between male, female, and into three different age groups. You've got 10 people in each group. There is no statistical significance whatsoever. Just show me a few nice, simple um, vertical bar charts. It's about all you need to do when you got 100 uh, points of data-ish. Actually, you get a bit out of it, but not a lot. But in a presentation like this, it's probably, in a conference like this, it's probably not worth going for the statistics that much. Other than to set comment, we did some statistics that proved because of a t-test or something. that. But don't put all the stuff up on there. It's not that interesting. And when you get to your PhD thesis, do remember that all the statistics that are in there are probably only of interest to your supervisor, your exam internal examiner, and your external examiner. Because nobody's going to read your PhD thesis, to be honest. It's the other papers that come from it. So how are we going This is the bit that's really fun. That's what we want to know about. What have you discovered? And why is it important? Who is it going to affect? Tell us those things, and you will have captured us. Ah, and what's your contribution to knowledge? Well, one of the contributions to knowledge that I have made of late is that I've discovered that because of the way that I get the students to basically learn the facts themselves and I point them in the right direction, is that in the final year, in the final semester, the correlation, it turns out, between their attendance at formal teaching sessions seminars, lectures, workshops, and the actual level of grade is R squared equals 0 0.003, which is, those who know a bit about statistics know that there is absolute, that means there's no correlation whatsoever, so I don't care whether the students turn up, as long as they turn up for one critical event, which is a 10-minute formal, formative review of their final draft. Fully feed, full feedback with it, good discussion with them, and <coughs> point out the formatting problems or the presentation issues as well. Four weeks later, they submit it. That's where they make between 10 and about 20% improvement in their grade. Between the formal review and the final uh, submission, which is actually, by the way, they put it back into Turnitin in, and they have another 10 minutes with me for their final marking. So that was an interesting contribution to knowledge that a lot of academics, not educationists, are not terribly keen on an admin. The university administration are even less enthusiastic because they're pushing attendance. It does have an interesting issue, of course, with international students in the UK on their tier four visas who are supposed to have 95% attendance. Um, and this is kind of an interesting tension. Yeah, I talked about this. Now, I've seen this and uh, I can't bother. But that, that is showing some work done by some students in the last couple of years about the accuracy or otherwise of GPS. And what we've discovered, if you've got a journey's worth of data taken every five seconds, or I got some data at one second, and we are looking at the acceleration of we, because we can't actually work very easily at the latitude longitude position, we take a second order derivative. We turn it from distance to velocity to acceleration. And what we can see is because of the error in the reading, every single reading is not precise to within a, an inch, say. It's within half a meter, perhaps. We're getting this sort of jitter. Now, we also find, as it happens, and this is an example of storytelling, We've got a couple of very interesting signatures, of very high positive and very high negative acceleration, which no vehicle on Earth except for a Formula One racing car and or rocket uh, assisted or uh, things or even jet, uh, military jets. Plus or minus one G is not something that can be done. Now this also, and so what we got them to do was to find ways of actually identifying some of the really odd there's other stuff going on as well to smooth this lot out, because all of this is, turns out to be more sideways movement of change of velocity than is actually real. Otherwise
otherwise we'd be shook up like a sort of image inside a, a sort of shaker. And we know we are. But the point here is, very simple, a tracking system, which we assume is accurate, and here we can see very clearly it's not accurate, and we need to find interesting ways, or an interesting exercise, to find ways of adjusting the measured point to the real point, without knowing where the real point is. And the mathematics of that are going to be quite fun. So we can use a picture like that, a date, so based on the data of our um, research and the analysis, and then we can talk about if I turn that into statistic, that's actually a statistics probably from it. And does that mean anything to anybody? It doesn't communicate a story, whereas that one does. Now what I'm going to do is take you through, oh my god, give me a minute. Very briefly, an example of how I could do a little presentation. I'm going to do it half a double speed or half time and half length, you might say what you'd be doing. But if we were doing a, an ex uh, presentation on information um, things, sources of inaccurate data, first we'll start off with a picture of here's lots of different things that capture data for, for, for big data from the Internet of Things, all sorts of sensors and gadgetry. We have a problem, as I mentioned earlier on this morning, that we have a problem about the veracity of data, how much of our data we capture can we actually trust, and the answer is, it's quite difficult. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do the analysis, it means we need to think about the data we're using. And if we're looking at uh, GPS data then, here's what actually got me started about five years ago. I was actually down in Chile at a conference, um, and we went halfway down to Valparaiso, and I was actually there, the restaurant, took a few photos of the very beautifully presented food in the restaurant, and had a wooden roof, and I discovered, when I got back to the hotel and connected to the internet, that that one was 22 kilometers away from, where, from there. So the location tagging of your photos on here is kind of interesting. It's not necessarily where you thought you were or where you knew you were. And I did various things. This one is, I was actually standing there and my phone went for that long walk over a period of about three minutes. About 150 meters it went here. Um, this one is where <coughs> I found my phone had, during the night time, gone for a walk for 400 meters. I then replicated it by switching the phone up. Uh, hadn't got any tracking going for a bit, so I then started taking photos inside the house and it went from there to there, which is about there. So that's 400 meters, then it's all kind of oscillated. And then when I went to Montreal uh, a few, two or three years ago, I was on top of Mont Royal. I don't know if you actually walked up the top of Mont Royal, any of you who were right up to the, to the telephone transmitter. Uh, that's quite, quite a nice one. It's a long way up the wall, but up there, five, uh, about a five kilometer area. So then I did go to the top of Montreal, stood there, a bit cold, for 25 minutes, taking about 50 photos, holding it like that, taking a photo every 30 seconds. Here is a trace over that 25 minutes of its measured altitude attached to the photos. It never got, over 25 min uh, minutes, it never got to the full height, 231 meters. So any altitude you measure is kind of bizarre. And that's the positioning moving around from, uh, over a period. And that's about, <coughs> I can't see the numbers here. Can I see them here? Yeah, it's about two or three meters movement. It's not too bad. <coughs> so that was what got me started. And then, oh, why is it important? Because retailers are trying to target us with location-based adverts. And a company called Think Near did some research over about five quarters in 2016 and discovered this blue line is the most important one, where the targeted adverts were going to places 
hundred kilometers away from where the people actually were, or vice versa, depends how you like to look at it. So we're getting adverts being sent to people who are not in the right place. Now this means they can get irritated. It's like spam email, isn't it? A spam advert now. So it has interesting consequences, the fact that these devices and even ordinary GPS trackers which you put on top of your camera to tag every photo, they're not accurate. Now, so I then got a whole lot of students, oh, this is one in the garden, this is one I showed earlier on, where over 24 hours, taking a reading every second, the trackers go for an interesting walk. So, I got my students to do some collection. They each collected 200 or 400 or 600 photos in known places on one or two smart uh, devices. <coughs> and I ended up with three of that list there who were co authors of a paper two years ago uh, in a SAS Global Forum. We had collected, or they had collected, should I say, on my behalf, more data about the inaccuracy of photos, photo, uh, location type photos, than anyone else in the world had ever done. And we discovered all sorts of interesting things. One was, they all came up with different insights, which was interesting. Different models of cameras, or mobile phones, have different ranges, uh, levels of accuracy, different distributions. Cor uh, Dave, David Cora, or came up with different types of building construction have significant impact. So if you go into Derbyshire and into a stone-built house with walls that thick, the errors are going to be really big. Victor Horensky came up with this one, which is really intriguing. Two different models. The HTC M8 actually is quite good. But the older HTC Desire S has a very bizarre performance characteristics. And these were sets of photos taken in pairs in the same location. So they're absolutely identical situation. <coughs> we found, unlike the government, uh, or the US government's statement about the accuracy of GPS, which is tightly defined, 10, meet, 10 meters plus or minus for 95% of the time, in good visibility. That's a critical point. These were in typical usage, not perfect visibility. So we found 85% of the photos were tagged within 25 meters. But the consequences are those other 15% from 25 meters out to, well, at least 1,800 kilometers. Future research, well, we're going to be doing more. I've collected now quite a f many, many tens of hours of one, one second data on that, going up journeys in the UK, journeys here, journey in China last week, and elsewhere. We're now getting um, a little board with a GPS tracker chip. <coughs> and we will do some more refined work to collect more data. Because my this GPS tracker only collects two of the um, statements that come out of the GPS uh, chip. And we want to analyze all the rest and tell us how many satellites there are. So there's lots more stuff we can do. So a I've what I've done there is to come up from the beginning, what we were doing, why we started it, why it's interesting, the commercial consequences, some of the interesting ideas that come out of it, the results, and where we're going to go in the future. All are done by pictures. ask a question about who is the audience as well. Really important to understand your audience and the type of language that they connect with so that you can make that emotional connection. And then when you've got that whole story, the facts, the intellectual connection 
and that emotional connection, then your message will be remembered and also will be understood. So has that, I hope that has uh, been of interest. I hope that you have learned from it. And every academic here is welcome, A, to use the video when you found it on my YouTube channel, and you're also welcome to read my um, computing.w.ac profile, and I will actually not just leave put there a PDF of the presentation, I will also leave a P uh, PowerPoint, so that you've got all the tools you need. Now you might want to replace that last little example of the uh, GPS IoT sort of data with a story that you'd like to do in your own way, but the rest of it, you're very, very welcome and encouraged to use those. Questions? No? No questions? Okay. <laughs>